Hey, hey, Blue Table fans. It's his eye. <laughs> apparently, a couple of you, apparently a whole eight people who watch this channel are not yet sick of this. I'm going to talk a little bit about fatherhood. I wonder how many of the views on this channel, which are not many, by the way, are uh, bots. Like, just on, I wonder how many are real people who are, like, watching it through. I put up a battle report, by the way, guys, and it was two hours, this battle report. It took us five hours to do it. And you know what the average view time on my battle report is? Four minutes. Yeah, so i to pump up those numbers. Uh, I haven't gone back to look at it since then. So let's talk about fatherhood. First off, uh, I was born in uh, 69. 69! Right before the moon landing was uh, faked. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I, I don't know. All right, anyway, uh, and I've got one little sister and a half-sister, and that's it. That's what I have. All right, so fast forward. Uh, first off, uh, I've been Mormon most of my life. Uh, I've been out for, I think, eight years now. And that, that's a whole other topic. Had a great time, by the way. Nothing bad to say. Uh, why is this relevant? Oh, it's because I served a, a Mormon mission in South America from 90 to 92. And then I, within six months, I met my first wife, Tammy, who is awesome, by the way. And <clears throat> we met at church where I was uh, uh, very involved. And uh, she was just an absolute vision. Uh, we, uh, from hi, my name is Sean, to will you marry me was two weeks. Yeah, that's right. So uh, not wasting any time. And from our very first date, we were inseparable. And in fact, all the way through, we just were, we were together all the time. We're working together. And when you have young kids, that is sort of like you're just, you're just running. It's like, it's like a cheetah running. You're almost flying through the air because everything is going so fast. You're getting diner dashed hard by life. We got married in uh, 94, and I was in college for uh, a degree in political science. And let's see. Yeah, Tammy was really amazing, and we had a wonderful young life together. We didn't have kids right away. We waited for five years. Uh, my first uh, daughter, McKenna, was born in 99. So I graduated from college in summer, and she was born like a month later, and like I just had all these changes, and uh, at my graduation, Tammy waddled up, and she and her feet were just swollen. They were just bursting out of these sandals, right? She grabbed me by the lapels, and she said, you're graduated now. You're going to support this family. That was the end of that. So I got a job uh, that summer. I got a job in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, as a teacher. And uh, that was, I got to tell you, that was really a wild time of life. But at the time, I owned, let's go back just a little bit earlier, I owned a game shop. And in the game shop, I had a little security camera, which recorded on VHS, and as I was reviewing it, I caught a conversation I had with one of my friends because I just found out that, uh, oh, it must have been the year before, I just found out that Tammy was pregnant with our first child. And he said, well, you know, how do you feel about it? And I said, well, my official reaction is I'm overjoyed. I'm excited. My unofficial reaction is, oh, crap, there goes my freedom. Like, literally, that's what I, <laughs> that's what I said. And I was super nervous, super nervous about, like, how, how, what was I going to do? And I was looking through the, 
the uh, newspaper. Yes, still newspapers back then. And looking at help wanted and trying to find this job, really prepping myself, wearing a tie to interviews, going all over Kingdom Come, trying to find that job. And uh, I just was, it's having that first kid, it's pretty scary. Knowing what I know now, it's old hat. Uh, totally confident about it. I'm going to fast forward, not fast forward, but I'm going to get to some of that later. And uh, so, yeah, when uh, McKenna was born, and she was a little baby, we were living in a trailer in my mother-in-law's dirt driveway way out, like in the outskirts of Oregon. And it was, it was like I was not used to baby crying. That was like really stressful. My advice for young dads having that very first baby is make a list. Make a list of all the things you can do for whatever the baby's needs are and like what are the possibilities of what you need to do. Uh, the second thing is get a lot of support. Get uh, the mom and relatives or whoever to work with you on it. And the reason is men don't deal well with futility. And a baby crying, that can be futility. Like, what is, what is this creature crying for? It's not communicating with you. So you as the father, you have to take the initiative and, like I said, have a list of things. Like, here's the 12 things that I'm going to do. Sometime, and sometimes the baby's crying just to cry. Or the baby is crying because there's too much noise around. So there could really be a lot of different reasons for it. And if you have that list and you're going, okay, I'm trying one, I'm trying two, I'm trying three, it helps to keep that sense of futility down. And you're going out and conquering and doing your manly thing. Number two, don't be afraid of that diaper change. If you know what you're doing, you can get any, no matter how gross it is, you can get any diaper changed in 90 seconds. Trick to a good diaper change is preparation. Just have all of your items nearby. Open the diaper up ahead of time. Don't take the diaper off and then try and figure out what it is that you're doing. So you've got to have a wipe in your hand. Okay, this is going to be gross. Maybe I shouldn't do this right now. You know what? I am. So you get a wipe in your hand and you open the diaper up and as you pull it open, you slap the wipe down and you start, and then, and you don't, don't pull that wipe up, and what, what are you even going to do with that? Just keep, like, wiping down, and then grab another wipe, which, of course, you've set up ahead of time. Don't try and pull them out of the little container then. Pull out, like, six of them ahead of time, and, and then, and just keep going. Just keep slapping them down like, uh, like baklava. You got to just, until it's all cleaned up, and you just get it all scooped up into that diaper, and, uh, and then you put, if it's a boy, you put another one on top because it's a spray edge. You fold up the dirty diaper, you clean it all up, you wrap it up. So now that's all contained. And you know what? Suppress your gag reflex. Just be a man, hold your breath, and just do it. And don't make a big fuss about it. And just help your wife and just do it. And let me tell you, if you changed every single diaper for that kid A to Z, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. It doesn't take that long to do it. And uh, then the last thing is get that clean one on there right away. And, um, you know, put on diaper rash ointment or whatever and uh, get it cleaned up. All right, anyway, so, yeah, I was really nervous uh, during the actual birth itself. Oh, by the way, get a doula. A doula is kind of like a midwife, but actually helps you through the entire process. So, you know, a labor could be long. The first one uh, for my first daughter was, I think, just around 24 hours. And boy, mom and dad are both getting wear, worn out during that time. And you need a third person to be in there and, and help you and, you know, sort of switch out for you. And it's not all, it's not like the movies where it's like 10 minutes of screaming and then the baby's out. No, there's a lot of pacing around. There's a lot of downtime. And, you know, it's not, it's not great for the woman, for the man. My tradition was to have vanilla pudding and uh, pink and white animal crackers. So I would have like a whole kit, books to read and, 
you know, how to entertain myself during that time. And really let the doula, because the doula will be as involved as you want. And I was always like, hey, you should be really involved. And when I was born, it was back in the day where the dads weren't even in there. They were out in the waiting room watching, you know, TV. And, uh, you know, <laughs> my dad and I were watching Creature from the Black Lagoon. And there's like a scream and my dad's like, was that the movie or your mom? <laughs> Oh my God. All right. So anyways, uh, so uh, when at the actual birth, I was, just, I was just being a smart ass. I had the video camera. You know, I was only supposed to shoot from certain angles, right? And uh, they were weighing the afterbirth, this like pot with stuff in it. And I'd go up and I'd show it and I'd go, is, does, is anybody hungry for stew all of a sudden? <laughs> which started the grand tradition of, at every birth, I would say something inappropriate. And, and quite frankly, I can't even repeat them. Uh, and, then, and then I took a picture, I was videotaping McKenna, who, you know, they were kind of wiping her down or whatever. And, and it turns out, maybe not so great to wipe them down. Uh, and if I had kids again, it wouldn't circumcise the boys. Definitely. I have some pretty strong opinions about it. Uh, but please don't, don't express them in the comments section <laughs> if you happen to have one. Uh, anyway, so I looked at, and all this, the Grinch's heart grew three sizes that day. I was like, she's so beautiful. She's so beautiful. I love her so much. And as it turns out, a man's brain actually will squirt out chemicals when you see your, your child for the first time to make you bond and be loyal and take care of this little child. And, it's, and let me tell you, it's quite a rush. It's really something else. So typically, I think a man doesn't bond with the child or doesn't want the child until it's actually born. And then it's on. All that protectiveness and that providing, that sort of kicks in. Everybody's different, of course, but that was the experience that I had. Like I was, like high, I was highly motivated to get a job and just take care of everything, which I did. Which I did. I started 16 years of being breadwinner at that moment. All right, so uh, we ended up moving to San Francisco. I was a teacher, and it was it was rough. It was a huge commute. I was up at 4:30 every day. Uh, I had to go down there early, live by myself in an unfurnished uh, condo. It was magic times. I was watching Friends. They were still producing episodes at the time. This is '99, and. Uh, yeah, it was just, I had a milk crate with a little TV on it, and I was eating corn dogs, just living by myself in that tiny little condo, and then finally Tammy came down with the baby, and, uh, yeah, it was a real, that was like, whew, I gotta tell you, it was wonderful being a teacher, but I definitely would not do it again. I think somebody asked me about that, you know, how was it teaching? It was great, I loved it, I loved every aspect of it, I worked at a really hard school where the parents really didn't give you too much trouble. They were just glad you were there. So in a way, <coughs> I have to say, my life has been an exercise in wonderful experiences. Like, you could, the things that I experience can't go back and do them again now. Impossible to do them now. And uh, because times only come once. All right. Back to whatevers. Two years later, uh, we're on Christmas break, and I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm pitching woo to my lovely young wife, and she's like, Sean, you gotta go out to the car and get the contraceptive. And I was like, I was like, ah, I don't really want to. Come on, what are the chances? <laughs> and that's how, that's how Jonah came about. That he was, he was wanted, but he was not planned. And, oh, a little story, a California story about, well, yeah, this is actually a time. Uh, Jonah was born, and I come home from work one day, and there's a picture of a tub. Uh, and it's, it was like uh, like a cartoon, like a, what's that called? Uh, it's a, like clip art or whatever, right? Of a boy, a little boy and a girl with their heads sticking out above the level of the tub with bubble bath on it and I was like oh yeah okay I know what this means so I got the good news that day it was really wonderful and um, Jonah was born in a birth home 
So the remaining three kids were all born in birth homes. You know, everybody's different, but personally, I would always do a birth home. And uh, so, uh, and had a doula too. And I, I was eating my vanilla pudding and white and pink animal cookies. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was really cool. Um, it's, a, it's a great experience. And you might think, oh, birth home, that's nah, not like a hospital. Well, guess what? The hospital's literally five minutes away. And if there's some emergency, and there's a midwife there, like she's trained. And, uh, and I remember with Jonah, boy, those midwives, there were five of, uh, like assistants or whatever. And they got one on each of her extremities, including her head. And they bent her into shape, and that baby came out. It was really amazing. And I was uh, really excited for that. Hold on, guys. Hello? Darling, do you need to get through? Well, I'm recording a video. No? All right, well, let, let, let me know. It's, it's okay. You can, just, you can just go. All right. Uh, so I had two little kids. And I was working, doing, had it working my butt off, and it, it was uh, quite, it was really quite a commute. I remember one day, I was coming around the corner, and in the bathroom, I saw my three-year-old daughter with her golden locks, so cute, absolutely adorable, and she goes up to the to the uh, drawer, and she opens the drawer, and. Um, she gets out my toothbrush. I'm like, oh, how sweet. She's going to use my toothbrush. Then she goes over to the toilet, cleans the toilet with the toothbrush, and then puts the toothbrush back in the thing. And I'm like, oh, no wonder I've been having, like, food poisoning. You know? And I was just like, guy, kids, man. It's, it's brutal. It is like, it is a bone-crunching exercise to have and raise a kid into adulthood. And let me tell you, the adventures don't stop once they turn into adults. So um, don't regret it. Love my kids. Huge sense of satisfaction. But there's a bit of a paradox there. You can't have kids and not have kids. Two different experiences. And you just, you just got to pick one. And I think it's okay. I think it's okay to not have kids. All right. So, <clears throat> the year is 2003, and I've been painting figures like a madman for six years, not professionally. It is not entered into Sean Gately's mind that he might actually make money off of this, and, or it might be a service that people would want. But I painted my own figures, and I love it can't get enough of it. This is the age of still where they're making things in metal. White metal, pewter, tin, whatever it is. And so the year is, uh, it's uh, so summer of 2003, and I find out that my dad is dying of terminal cancer, and he has about three months to live. And that was hardcore. So I go to visit him in Oregon, and he's still doing good. He still looks like his regular healthy self. And we're at his house, like up in the mountains. And I mean, when you drive up to this place, you can see, I'm not exaggerating, you see the backs of eagles that are flying by down in the valley. It is, it's dizzying. And that's where I hail from, the backwoods of Oregon. And I got to tell you, I don't think everybody really has been into a real, real, real forest. And primarily, like, no cell phone, no wallet, just a pocket knife and your boots. And clothes, of course. And anyway, so he lives way up there, and he's smoking, chain smoking his roll of your own. Why stop now? And we're on the balcony, and there's a big truck in the driveway. And he says, Sean, I waited to get that truck. He was three months from retirement. Like, literally, he's going to die right before he retires. 
And he's like, Sean, don't wait. Live your life now. Uh, you can come through. It's okay. I, I don't even think he can see you. Okay, She's shy, guys. Don't say that. Beautiful. Loving it. Well, too late now. I'm not editing the video. All right, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, that, that really stuck. That, that was shallow how wants a gal right there. That stuck with me, which is don't wait. Live your life now. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. And uh, for better or for worse, that's sort of informed how I approach life through low these many years. And the, all the, the rest of the summer, I was in contact with him every day. I went back to San Francisco. I was calling him every day on my way home from work. You know, we were talking about this and that. And about this time, summer of 2003, I uh, went down to the local game shop. And I was lamenting to my buds that I had to get a job for the summer, and, but who's going to want to hire me for 10 weeks? And a friend of mine, he said, hey, why don't you paint my dwarf army and, you know, tell me how much it would be. So I told him, and I finished that army in three days. I cranked it. Because I, I was always painting. I was showing up every week. Hey, I painted this. I painted this. I painted this. And he was like, this is, this is super, Sean. This is really great. And he paid me the money. And I went home, and I showed Tammy the money. And boy, let me tell you, she changed her tune about, you know, the whole painting, the figures thing. And then the following week when I turned in the dwarf army, and I did like a whole thing. I painted like 120 dwarfs, war machines, and I painted a giant uh, dwarven like fortress as a display board. I mean, and I was good. I knew what I was doing, tons of practice, and, uh, I, and I had the discipline to paint whole armies. In fact, one of my early projects was painting the Dark Angels chapter, not a company, 1,000 space marines and the vehicles to go along with them. And I was, yeah, I was a machine. All right, so I went back the next week and two other guys came up to me and said, hey, I heard you finish this. Can you do our armies too? We have money. We don't have time to do it. And then it just, it just grew and grew and grew and grew from there. Now, uh, in 2004 is when I started Blue Table Painting, and I went to, um, what was it? Uh, I started Blue Table Painting in January of 2004. We were still in California, didn't have any idea that we'd be somewhere else, and in, I think it is March or April of 2004, we went to Seattle to visit some relatives, and I went to a grand tournament and both played in it, and I had an army that I painted really well, some autumn wood elves, and they won best painted at a grand tournament. I was like, oh wee, that's awesome. It's really great. And I, and I had commissions by then, too. I had enough commissions where that's what I was doing. So I ended up quitting my teaching job uh, over Christmas break, 2003, and we went on, while we were in Seattle, we went on Lending Tree because they were giving loans to just anybody at the time. Boy, I wish for those days again where any old buddy could just get a loan, get into a house. Ah, oh, fantastic. And frankly, reasonable rates. Like we got a six bedroom for 196. And it was in Utah. So that's how we ended up in Utah. Uh, Tammy has relatives out here. And we ended up in summer of 2004 moving to Utah. And I was still I was doing the uh, blue table painting thing, mostly on my own. And, uh, but slowly it just, it just grew and grew and grew from there. And back to kids. Then, uh, did you forget something? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, we went to, do you want to be on the, no, on the show? No, yeah. you don't? Okay. Right, I'm just checking. Sensitive to your feelings. No, sweet. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so that's when uh, Griffin was born. And he was uh, absolutely wonderful. A great experience in terms of the pregnancy and childbirth. What was I learning as a father? Man, when they're really little, you're just kind of like, you're barely surviving. 
Like that is, that is rough. And guys, it's, it's a tough call because when you have to get up at a certain time in the morning, well, the stress levels can rise when you're getting woken up a couple times a night. And quite frankly, you know, there's better people than I to do it. Uh, I was lucky because Tammy was a stay-at-home mom, so she basically fielded all of that. And also had blue table painting. Like, if I had to go, go in at 11 or 12 or get my stuff done later, I could do it. And so Griffin, wa Griffin was our adventurous child. Like, one day, one day he was like, he's looking at the eggs in the fridge. He's like, can I throw these eggs against the wall in my room? And I was like, no. No, you may not do that. Well, guess what? Later that night, 18 eggs, one of those big cartons went in, and they just went ever in the carpet, on the walls, in the clothing, everywhere. And I was like, and Tammy was like, hey, why don't you let me handle this, and you can just go do whatever's. And I was like, you know what? That sounds great. And so I just left. And uh, yeah, we had to have the carpet professionally cleaned. It was, it was a disaster. There was beadboard. Oh, ha, 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 ha. And um, another time, and you know, there's times where you're going to be scared for their lives. Like we were at this uh, church event and all of a sudden Griffin was gone. I think he was like five at the time. And that like, so when I showed up, Tammy was like, Griffin's missing. And there were like, it was at night, People were out with flashlights and fields looking for him. And I was like, this is the this is a nightmare. This is this is the nightmare you live as a parent where the child's like, is he in a ditch? Was he abducted? Yeah, I mean it was crazy. And his shoes were still in the church. He let and this is the middle of winter, so there's like two feet of snow on the ground. Griffin's nowhere to be found. His shoes, little shoes are still there. Everyone's like worried the police are there. He just decided he wanted to go home. So he just went out in his socks and was like, well, I guess I'll walk home. I'm bored of this. And a, uh, a young couple found him and uh, they called the police and base, and that's, so within like 30 minutes, the whole thing was over. Oh man, come on, buddy. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? And the thing is though, Griffin was the child where I most related to him. Because I was like, oh, this is, this is our free spirit right here. Uh, Jonah was very, very mild from the very beginning. Like when he was a little baby, I, we have this great picture of him. He's wrapped up in his little papoose. He's like, he's like 11 months or whatever. And you just see this joy on his face. He's literally going like this because he has a stocking. And we all had our stockings for Christmas and we're opening our stockings. And he was so excited. And I remember he was, he was just like, Dad, they're always... The, you know, the younger kids are taking, this is later. It's like, they're taking my stuff. They want my stuff. And I was like, all right, here's how this is going to work. I said, you know, if they're fighting you for your stuff, there's a never-ending stream of things that come in. We, we have uh, not scarcity, but prosperity. And so I said, if, you know, if you need, I'll, repl I'll replace anything. So just be like, hey, here, it's yours. And then just let me know what it is, and I'll get you one. And um, so... Uh, that was that was something I wanted my kids. This video is going to be super long. I really wanted my kids to not have scarcity mentality, like you know, growing up, money doesn't grow on trees. Don't ask me for things. You know, the parents are always like stressed out, and <clears throat> so I say things like, "If it's not a good time, I say, hey, I'm in between giant wads of cash." My kids are very familiar with that that saying. Or I'll say something like, hey, why don't we enjoy what we have for a little while, and then we can write down new things that we want, and just hold off on those for a little bit. And But you can have those things. And so Griffin one day, he sees, because we're in a Utah home that have basements, so they have window wells where there would be windows in the basement, but of course it's looking at it dirt, so there's like a little cavity there with uh, like a metal uh, backing on it, and it's called window wells. And uh, so he looked at the terrarium, or the aquarium, was like, oh, there's fish in here. This looks like an aquarium. So he got the hose at night, 
like seven or eight at night, he put the hose into the window well and he turned the water on and he was going to dump the fish in it. Well, he fell asleep or whatever. And in the morning, I get out of bed and guess what? The carpet is like a, uh, what is it called? A waterbed because there's four inches of water over the entire lower level of the house. And I was like, oh, and we figured out what happened. He was planning on dumping fish and making an aquarium. But of course, it's not watertight, so that doesn't work. <laughs> okay, that times like a lot. It was, was uh, you know, I got, I got a lot of great Griffin stories. One morning, I come in. So what he, he was nocturnal, so he would basically outlast everybody. Everybody would get tired and go to sleep at some point, and then he would wake up and have a run of the house. And one time, I came in in the morning, and he had gotten every beanbag, blanket, uh, pillow cover, uh, towels, anything of that sort. He made a giant hill in the family room, and he had his shirt off, and he was sleeping like this on top of it, like a barbarian prince. <laughs> I was like, oh, come on. Another time, we're going home. I'm going home. He's like, he says, look, Dad. And he tries to jump off the sidewalk, and he fell. And uh, I can't remember what happened. His helmet flew off, and he conked his head straight up on the concrete. And it sounded like someone had dropped a bowling ball from four feet. Clunk. And I was like, and he was just, his head was lolling like this. He was out of it. He was senseless. And I picked him up, and I was running home with him in my arms. And he was going, clock, clock, clock. And I was like, oh, God, did, you know, did my child permanently Dane Bramage himself? And, yeah, but turns out he was fine. He just recovered from it. And all my kids now, by the way, are, they're older, they're healthy, they're happy, and it's really wonderful. Oh, I got like five minutes. I better wrap this up. So now comes, and I'm, I'm in the middle of doing the business this whole time. I'm starting to get like 10, 20 employees. I'm always down there. Oh, man, if this cuts out, by the way, I'm not going to fix it or edit it. I'm just going to put it up. Uh, Willow is the princess. Okay, so we wanted a girl first. Then uh, Tammy wanted a boy, which we got. And then the third one, she didn't care, so we got a boy. And then the fourth one, we, wanted, we definitely wanted it to be a girl, and we got a girl. So we got everything we wanted. We got Emperor's Choice, two girls, two boys. Absolutely wonderful. And Willow was the princess. I knew what I was doing. I was super patient with her. The business was going well enough that I could get up in the middle of the night and help out a lot and uh, change all those diapers and do all of that stuff. Uh, and, you know, Willow wanted milk. She loved, uh, like, regular cows. But when she was little, like three or four. And I remember one time Tammy was like, hey, you know, take it easy on the milk because there's limited supply. And I was like, well, actually, there's not. I could literally go down right now and just buy 10 gallons of milk if I wanted. So I would tell her, there's always plenty of milk for you. So, of course, the traditional thing that uh, she grew up uh, very much in a different...